Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Keith Cordero. He's the host of the Philosophy of Sales Podcast, account exec, a big closer himself. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about meditation and the mindful sales rep. Keith, welcome to the show. Hey, Colin. Thanks. Happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. This is, you know, we were just kind of chatting pre-call and um, I was literally having this conversation uh, or a conversation very similar to this with one of our account execs last night. Um, for I, I've got a slightly different lens, but that was why I was so excited to get you on the show is because I haven't done much in me- mindfulness and meditation. And I, I'm a little bit, you know, ADD sometimes, probably not full, but just I use that as an excuse because I'm always distracted. And I've always found sort of the sitting down, um, closing my eyes and just like being there uh, challenging. And so I, I, th- I found like stoicism really spoke to me, but I'll be honest, I didn't really get fully deep into uh, as nearly as deep into the, the mindfulness uh, as it sounds, sounds like you are. So I'm really excited to get you on here, uh, learn from you. And as I mentioned, I'm going to, re- I'm going to forward this, this recording right to our rep as soon as we finish. Cause I, I know, I, I think he'll really appreciate a different perspective. Excellent. Yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting how those timely situations and conversations seem to pop up um, around things of this nature. So um, happy that it, we know at least one person that'll gather some value from it. <laughs> exactly. We've got at least one listener, and I'm going to yes. force them to listen to yes. it. So. Yes, and that's that's all we really need. Padding the stats. <laughs> <laughs> So, so talk to me, like you, you spent, uh, spent some time in sales. Talk to me about your, your, your time in sales and then your journey into meditation. Yes. Yeah, so I, um, I've been in medical and dental sales for the last 12 or 13 years, um, specifically in dental, the dental industry and the dental world for about five years. Um, currently, I'm working for a company by the name of Crosstex, and they are a manufacturer of infection prevention products. So my role is pretty unique. It's split up. One aspect of it is cultivating relationships with other sales reps, like distribution and dealer sales reps that are, that are selling our products. And so it's coaching them and helping to train them on how to appropriately present our products to their end users and their clients. And then another aspect of my role is, you know, just kind of grind, cold calling, prospecting, knocking on doors. I think that's always going to be a part of sales. Um, so those are kind of the two dynamics of of, of my role currently. Cool. And yeah. so, so what led you into, into meditation? Gosh, um, you know, I, I think it was a pretty organic, natural progression when I was... Probably my earliest memory that the first breadcrumb in this trail is probably I found a copy of the book Zen and the, and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by um, yeah. Robert Persig. And I found it when I was like a preteen in my grandparents' house, which if you know my grandparents, um, that's a, to this day a mystery. I'm not sure. I'm not <laughs> sure how that book wound up in their bookshelf, but it did. And I uh, I cracked it open. I started reading it. And if 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 no one's familiar with the book, I highly suggest it. Um, but kind of in a nutshell, it's it's a way of looking at Eastern philosophy and religion from a Western perspective, right? So a perspective that's kind of based in um, technology and advancement and, 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 you know, as you mentioned earlier, distractions, right? I think we all are, are, are subject to these distractions of, of modern life and how um, Eastern philosophy and Eastern religion and, and things like Taoism and Buddhism and kind of the idea of, of taking a moment and being present in that moment and being mindful of that moment um, can help cure some of the ailments of, of, of the, the downside of, of the advancement of technology and things of that nature. There's pros and cons to it. So um, that really kind of opened up my eyes to Eastern religion and philosophy, which then led me to um, Taoism and then led me to Buddhism, which then um, as I got deeper into Buddhism and started going to 
different like retreats and 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 dharma talks and things of that nature uh opened up my eyes to meditation so probably in my early 20s i'm 38 now so in my early 20s is when i really picked up the uh the meditation bug and and, and really started to implement it into my daily life very cool and i've always found that like as, as salespeople, we're, we're kind of looking for that edge. And I, I feel like with, for myself, maybe uh, in the role of sales, it's very up and down. It's very, it's very much, it very much can be a roller coaster if you let it be. Um, can, you, can you talk to me about how it's, how meditation and mindfulness has impacted your sort of career as a sales rep? Yeah, absolutely. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess it depends on how you look at it. I don't really know what a, a a life in sales is like without meditation um, because my sales career didn't start until after my meditation practice started. Um, so I do know that meditation has, I think allowed me to have more of a empathetic and compassionate view for every single person that I communicate with on a daily basis in my normal life or in my professional career. And, and especially in the last couple of years, this kind of empathetic selling, consultative selling, empathy, compassionate, these are all buzzwords within the sales world. Um, but it's still, that's kind of a pretty new thing. So for me, it's been really awesome to see the business world and the sales world start to um, utilize these these like ancient practices of meditation and mindfulness and and, and use those as resources to, to help us be better, you know, sales professionals. So it's been really interesting to see the opposite of that, as opposed to being in business and in sales and then kind of implementing all of these um, things like meditation. I was kind of on the other side of things. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I, my journey and I, I went through, I, I did a bit of reading on the, the, on Buddhism. I read the, um, I, I remember the, the book that I, the book that Steve Jobs gave everybody when uh, at his funeral uh, was autobiography of a yogi. And I remember I read yeah. that. I read some. Oh, it was a book on Buddha, and I can't remember. Um, I've read a ton on the I, the Buddhism stuff. Didn't really stick to me. I I liked it. It was interesting. I got yeah. into the. Um, I met an entrepreneur here in Vancouver who was who claimed he said he was he described himself as a student of happiness. So I got into reading uh, like quite a bit of positive psychology and I found there was elements of sort of Bo Buddhism and Stoicism and, you know, newer sort of principles of psychology sort of woven in, which I found really impactful. Um, and so I've, I was somebody who started as this um, frightened child in sales. You know, I, I've been, yeah, I've been in sales. I started in sales like B2B sales when I was 18. And so the, the emotional journey of ups and downs um, were, was pretty tremendous. And I, I wouldn't, I wasn't, um, I had, battle hardened is not the right word because it's not about sort of hardening yourself, but it's, it's more about like, I, I think about being in control, uh, of your own, of your own self. And for me, that's been something that's been a, a journey of, uh, on my own. Um, you know, you, you know, I've had a couple instances of walk, had to walk away from a million and a half in commission because, you know, the company's going out of business. It's like, well, how do you handle that? You know, how do you prepare yourself for, you know, this is probably going to happen again, you know, looking in your pipeline, you know, you're looking at all these deals and you're like, well, you know, I enjoy talking to all of these people, but you know, 80% of them aren't going to close. Maybe, you know, 70% of them aren't going to close if I'm lucky. So like, how do you handle with that rejection? And so yeah. I, I totally agree with like, you know, I'm not too particular about you need to do meditation. You need to be a stoic. You need to be a Buddhist. You need to be, you know, X, Y, Z. If you're going for a run, it gets, you know, it helps you clear your mind, then do it. It's just, it's whatever you can stack sort of on top of yourself to make yourself more of a, I don't know, superhuman run, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there, there, you know, there's no magic bullet, right? We've, we've heard that from the sales gurus of the world for years. There's other than the ones that try to sell you one, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's agreed. There's no magic bullet. There's no magic bullet in sales. There's no magic bullet in life. You know, um, I, for me, and it sounds like for you too, and I think lots of people that I talk to, um, it's all about, like you said, how do we deal with these struggles and challenges that we face? Because we're all going to face them. There's, there's no way to alleviate suffering and struggling in, in life and in our careers. Um, so we should just be prepared that it's part of it. And, 
and and cultivate a, an appropriate reaction for us to better navigate through those challenges and stuff and, and the, the, the suffering that presents itself to us, right? Whether, whatever it may be, as long as it's healthy. That's such an, like, such an important piece. And it, it's something that struck me. It was like really early. I think I was in college when I read this, but it was, I want to say it was either seven habits of highly effective people. I want to say it was seven habits, highly effective people. And it was a quote from Viktor Frankl. And it talks about in, it was in between stimuli, stimuli and response, there's a, there's a gap and that's your sort of, and in that gap, you can choose how you respond. And I totally oh, I butchered that. the quote. Um, but it was from, I, I didn't figure out the book until later on, but Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl or Viktor E. Frankl. Um, it, incredible book. Doesn't really, you, he references some of the, like you can tell that there are Buddhist and Stoic influences in him, but he was a psychiatrist that was taken into the concentration camps. Wow. And it's his perspective and it's, wow. it's not, he's not trying to like glorify it. He, his, his objective was to give you a like day to day life. And this is what it felt like to be in the camp. And yeah. then what his, ins, his insights were, you know, this is like how people mentally dealt with and sort of, you know, processed and, and sort of stored that information or, or their experience dictated whether or not they were going to survive. And that's a, it's a really, um, it's a very short way of sort of summarizing and, and maybe, a, maybe not 100% correct to his sort of methodology that he presents because he tells the story, which was wow. Um, and then has like the, the section after the book, which is sort of his, his theories on um, psychology and, and sort of some of, the, some of the research that came out of that, um, wow. which I, I just found super interesting if, to have that perspective. Um, but I want to I want to bring it back, like because the what you said there is is basically we have the opportunity to choose how we respond to certain things, and so how does how does meditation sort of help us cultivate that mindset? You know, I think that meditation um, helps cultivate the mindset of of you know at the very basic of being present and mindful of the moment, both internally and externally. Right. Of, because I think a lot of times, look, we're humans. We all, you know, emotions are a large part of what make us wonderful and beautiful and, and can also be a source of suffering for ourselves and for others. Right. And so I think what mindfulness uh, and meditation helps us do is it helps us to highlight that gap, as you call it. And in, in Buddhism, it's called the middle way. Right. So it's not all of it's not an excess and it's not a complete depletion of this or that. It's finding that gap, that middle way. They also talk about it in meditation. When you inhale, there's that gap between the inhale and the exhale. And that's where really the gap that you want to try to cultivate to, to, to live in because that gap is the exact present moment. And so a lot of times for us, you know, you, we get really anxious about maybe things that we're thinking about need to happen or we get maybe shameful or, or filled with regret or depression for things that have happened or have not happened in the past. So we're in this constant state of bouncing back and forth between what will happen or could happen and what has happened. And so these are these distractions that we keep talking about, right? And so we kind of lose sight of just the simple present moment. In Buddhism, there's a, um, there's a quote that, that basically details what nirvana Right, what transcendence really looks like? Because somebody was asking this Buddhist monk, "What does transcendence look like? What does nirvana look like? What is it? Is it filled with flowers? Is it this beautiful, blissful heaven?" And he just looked at him and said, "Chop wood and carry water." Right, that's what he did every single day. He got up, chopped wood for a fire, he got water from the well, and that's that was his life. And that, to him, that that was transcendence, which is, it's just it's just being in this present moment. And I think. Whatever that, meditation isn't the only way to do it. Like you said, going for a run, people play music, some people draw, you know, some people read a book, whatever it is, we've all been in these states of, of meditation in our lives. Every single one of us, whether we think we have or not, we're all in these kind of states where we're hyper-focused on the present moment and everything else just seems to kind of wash away. And I think that that's like the true essence of what being a human being is about. Um, and I think meditation is one key that can, that can unlock um, 
our cultivation of that. Mm -hmm. It's funny that the sort of the impact that it can have on your, like the impact that mindset can have on your performance as a salesperson is tremendous. The, you know, everything. The, the conversation I was having is, uh, of course, your whole life. This is a sales podcast, so I'll, I'll try and tie it back in. But the, yeah. the conversation I was having with our AE yesterday, he's a good sales rep. And he's had a couple of, you know, had a couple of sales calls that he was struggling on. And he was, uh, you know, fair play to him that he was reviewing his own calls and saying, okay, what could I do better? What, what was I doing worse? And we were able to sort of diagnose a couple of things. Um, but it was the, you know, one of his takes was the, like his mindset, the, it was, there was something that was causing him to have sort of a negative mindset or not negative mindset, but just not a super confident mindset. And he was bringing that onto the calls and you can hear the difference between, you know, his calls from a couple months ago where like the sun is shining, things are great. He's smiling, he's confident, he's rocking and rolling. And the difference between that, which is sort of like beautiful Wizard of Oz in color versus like Wizard of Oz going back to black and white where you just, you lose so much. It's a lot flatter. It's yeah. And so the, for, for him and for, for myself is like getting, being able to sort of cultivate that, uh, that winning mindset, uh, even not winning mindset, but more of a stable mindset. So you're not so driven by the ups and downs. It's going to help you get into the right mindset for every call so that you can be the most, you know, you, you can work every possible opportunity to the best possible outcome. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And sales mindset is, it's everything. It, it's, it's, it's like in basketball, you know, my, my son plays basketball. I played basketball in high school and I try to explain to him, it's not about the tricks and this or that. It really, it boils down to your mindset. How much do you believe in what you're doing? How much do you believe what you can accomplish? It's the same thing when you're picking up a phone or you're walking into an office, or you're sitting down to have a business-minded conversation with somebody, um, you know, how much do you believe, one, in, in, in your product, two, or your product or services, two, in your ability to appropriately present those products and services to a prospect or a client, and, and three, how much do you, you know, care, right? Like, if you're having a down day and you're down on yourself, and you're like, I, it doesn't matter, I'm going to pick up this phone call, someone's going to hang up on me or tell me no. So what's even the point? Like, so you're already kind of in this defensive mindset before they even pick up the phone because you already based off of, of your previous attempts know that, or feel like, you know, that, that what the outcome already is and it's negative. So you, it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy. So yeah, mindset is everything. And, and something like meditation isn't going to take those ups and downs away. Right. It does. It, it doesn't alleviate that stuff. But what it can do is it can allow you to be more aware of when those highs and when those lows are presenting themselves to you internally and that you're projecting those out externally. So you can kind of be aware of taking a moment. I always whenever I do little blocks of like prospecting. So like I'll just a, a two hour block of I'm just like banging the phone out, shut everything off. But but the first, you know, five to 10 minutes before I make that call, I sit, I, I sit there with my breath and I just focus on my breath and I get in the moment and I get, you know, I just, I kind of let everything else wash away so that I can be present a hundred percent in that moment, not only for myself, but also for my prospects, right? I need to make sure that I'm really interrupting their day because that's what I'm doing. I'm in, we're all interrupting somebody's day. So I'm interrupting their day and I need to make sure that what I'm presenting to them, the value that I, that I have to present them is worth breaking up their day for, right? And if I don't have the a killer positive mindset, then I'm just wasting everybody's time. No. 100%. Yeah. And you got to be able to connect it to like, I'm, I'm going to waste it for a reason. I, I strongly believe that, you know, our product does, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's going to... Yeah. You know, it's it's going to save you this outcome. Like if you're, you're preventing people's comes from getting infected, I'm assuming. I don't know anything about dentistry, but let's let's go with that. You're smiling, so I think I'm close, but probably wrong. <laughs> but like you're saving people from these horrible infections, right? And yeah. that's why you're picking up the phone. I was like, the more the more dials I make, the more you know infections I can help you know prevent, right? And not everybody's going to be able to prevent infections, um, but you need to be able to sort of tie tie the reason you're calling into the like or the tie the outcome that your customer is going to achieve with the reason you're calling so if you're 
if you're just sitting there and this, this is how, you know, this sort of ties into that mindset piece is if you are able to um, almost choose your mindset, because if you like, if you do work on this, you are almost able to sort of say, okay, I'm feeling this way. You let it drain away. I'm going to replace those feelings with sort of, I'm going to remind myself. So I'm going to get into the, I'm going to move myself into this mindset. Now you're thinking, okay, it's not just about the cold call. It's about reducing these infections or helping this VPS sales not get fired and make sure that yeah. they're hitting quota. Absolutely. Nailed it. So, so talk to me about how I do this right. These all sound like really great things to be able to do. And, and I'm realizing I got to uh, credit where credit is due. The be, being able to select your mindset, I'm, I'm stealing that from a podcast. It was episode 54, Mike Fiascone from uh, 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 DocuSign. I was like, I know it was one of the document oh, services. I didn't want to say the wrong one. Um, he's like their director of um, sales productivity. Anyway, I, I'm stealing that from him. So if you're interested on like choosing your own mindset, check out episode 54 because it was really good. Um, but James's plug. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, totally unplanned. I was like, oh, I'm uh, I'm remembering this. So so talk to me, Keith, about how do we how do I do this right? Right. You know, there's many different ways of meditation. There's many different ways of clearing your mind. What tell me about um, some some like sort of simple ways of that we can sort of get into it and then we'll maybe talk about some more advanced tactics. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, the simplest way for somebody to start it off would be what in Pali or Sanskrit is is called uh, anapan, anapanasati which is just an, um, their way of saying mindfulness of breathing. Um, and, and really the idea is um, to suspend all judgment thinking, right? To just focus on the breath, to, to, to allow any thoughts that may arise, ideas, things of that nature to just kind of breeze by. Um, because the big thing in Buddhism is... Um, Suffering is caused by our attachment to things, our attachment to ideas and to thoughts and to people and to things and both good and bad. There's, there's really no difference between the two. And so meditation is a way to cultivate and practice um, the release of those attachments by focusing on things like the breath. So the easiest way to start would just be carve out five or 10 minutes. Hell, carve out one minute of your day. Right. They've, if anybody has like an Apple Watch or something like that, they have a really awesome app that's literally called Breathe. And you can just set it to remind you once a day, literally for one minute to just breathe. And and it's got like it, it's really uh, on the Apple Watch. It's nice because when you do the inhale, it has like some vibrations that will kind of vibrate on your wrist. So you don't even have to look at it. You can just sit there with your eyes closed and breathe in when it's vibrating and then and then breathe out. And it does it for a minute. And so. You know, in this day and age, I think something like that, like an app is really cool to have because it's just like, oh, hell, I'll just do one minute a day. And then once you start cultivating that habit, um, you'll start seeing results. Um, I actually, it was funny. I, um, I found this article today when I woke up. I woke, that was, again, one of these uh, coincidences that happened to pop up today. And I've, I've got it in front of me. And it was published uh, on Inc. And it's called Neuroscience Reveals 50-Year-Olds Can Have the Brains of 25-Year-Olds If They Do This One Thing. So, well, this one thing happens to be meditation. So um, there was this neuroscientist, Sarah Lazar, from Harvard Medical School, and um, she did these studies on meditation, and she took folks that were lifelong meditators, so they've been meditating for 15, 20 years plus, and then she had a control group and she showed on a, I'm looking back at this article that on a neurological way, um, the long-term meditators showed that those with a strong background actually increased the gray matter in several areas of the brain that are connected to things like uh, um, decision-making, working memory, things of that nature. So, I mean, th these are things that that it's not just kind of a new age, let's burn some incense and put on a tie-dye and like, man, meditation will solve everything. I mean, scientists, neurologists, there's been tons of studies that have shown how useful just carving out 10, 15, 20 minutes of your day and just sitting and just breathing can really be for you. That's huge. I, I just finished taking this. Um, I, I do a lot of walking, running, cycling, and uh, I, I try and listen to audiobooks um, on my ride. 
And I just finished listening to a, a great course. It's called The Learning Brain. Um, and they, they actually referenced that study and, and had talked okay. about, yeah, because they, they were talking about can your, can your working memory, because uh, typically as we age, uh, working memory is one of the things that, uh, that goes. Um, right. And so they're like, well, the, they're talking about all the different studies is can, <clears throat> can we have an impact on our working memory? And, and sort of delay the signs and delay the symptoms of aging. And that was one of the studies they researched saying, yes, that some research points to the fact that, yes, that we can actually have this impact. Um, yeah, well, um, in that particular study, um, it actually showed that people that were 50 years old, that their gray matter in their brain, which affects all these cognitive things, was supposed to have been diminished, but they had just as much that, that somebody that was 25 had. So, I mean, that's huge. That's and it's like, you know, super hu human superhero stuff, you know, we like yeah. talk about being like having superpowers. I mean, that, that, that's pretty big, you know. For sure. And, and so we talked about the sort of the intro here was sort of 10 minutes. So 10 minutes a day, even one minute a day, just so walk, walk me through, what do I need to do? So just, I'm, so, you know, yeah, I would, you know, find a quiet spot, um, and, you know, obviously turn off your phone and things of that nature so there's no distractions. Maybe put your phone on do not disturb and just set it for, let's say, five minutes to start. And what you would do is, is in Buddhism, it's called flashing or um, absolute bodhicitta, which is just kind of in any type of meditation, this is how you start. So you just breathe in and you can think to yourself one and then breathe out and think to yourself too. And just continue doing that for the whole entire time. One in, two out. And what's gonna naturally happen is what in Buddhism they call the monkey mind. It's our minds as humans, the, the, just the way that they work um, is that we're always trying to put these patterns together and there's just like billions of thoughts and ideas popping up at, er, er, after another, boom, 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 boom. So that's go going to happen when you meditate. You hear a lot of people say, I can't meditate, I can't sit still for that long, or I can't stop thinking. There's this preconceived notion that meditation is like clear in your mind when it's really not. It's just sitting there and allowing these thoughts to occur. And, and when something pops up, you'll start thinking about something. Uh-oh, what am I going to do for dinner? And the moment that you think of it, just go back to your one. You don't have to get upset at yourself. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm terrible at meditating. You know, you, nothing, just when it happens, go, oh, okay, breathe in, one, breathe out, two, and just kind of keep coming back to the breath, keep coming back, back to the breath. And I mean, they call it practice because that's what it is, right? The more that you do it, the more that you're going to see that it's easier to get back to that state and the more benefits that you're going to see when you're not in that state. Okay. And so we're, so basically we find a quiet spot. Uh, we got to get the office who just, he puts his noise canceling headphones on and just sort of sits there, um, yeah. which is great and, and does his sort of breathing. Um, so 10, 10 minutes breathing in, you breathe in, count to one, you breathe out, count to two. That's it. And perfect. And yeah. if I do this a couple of times, it's going to, I'll, I'll be better. I'll be mindful and, <laughs> or, or is it more like, is it more like going to the gym where I got to sort of practice regularly? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why they call it a practice. You know, it's, it's a practice and it's something that really the early stages, that's why I say do it for a minute a day, do it for five minutes because the act in the beginning, the act isn't what's important. It's the habit that you're creating. That's really important because it's, it's the more that you do it, it's like a muscle. The more you work it out, the stronger that you're going to be. The more that you work on meditation, um, the, the, the better the effects are going to be in your day-to-day -day life, right? So then after maybe a week or two, then you can start something that's more intermediate, like walking meditation. Um, and this is a huge thing in Zen Buddhism. Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Zen Buddhist, um, talks a lot and actually has this amazing piece about walking meditation. I can send it over. You can maybe link it up in, in, in the notes. Um, but really, it's, it's kind of the next step. So when you're sitting and you're breathing, you're focusing on the present moment. You're being mindful of the present moment. Well, walking meditation is similar. You're still present in the moment, but now you're 
uniting the mind and the body. You're uniting the internal and the external. You're focusing on the way that your feet hit the asphalt or the ground, right? And you're focusing on um, the things that are surrounding you. Now, you don't want to do this with music or anything like this. Your 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 number one focus is on the meditation practice. So you can still breathe in, breathe out. That's how I would suggest starting any meditation is just taking five minutes to breathe in, breathe out, finding that, you know, resetting yourself, setting the table. Um, and then just go for a walk. I used to do this a ton. I don't work in an office anymore. I work remotely. But when I used to work in an office, I would make sure to carve at least 10 or 15 minutes out of my day. And I was like, you know, it was mostly lead generation. So I was just 60, 70 calls a day, just like banging out calls. Most of the time people hanging up on me. Right. So I just, I made it, uh, I made it a goal to make sure I carved 10 or 15 minutes out of my work day to just go on a walk. And I would do walking meditation. Um, and I mean, just doing that simple thing was you know, amazing, right? To, to just coming back and being able to hit the phones again and feeling refreshed. And um, so walking meditation is, is probably the next step up. Gotcha. And so that's, if I can summarize, you're walking around, you start with a breathing exercise in on the one, out, you count to two, and then you're focusing on the, the sensation of, of your feet hitting the ground. Absolutely. Every sensation. So, uh, you know, and you can start this doing your breathing meditation. So the, the sensation of your breath going through your nostrils, right. And leaving over your tongue, over your teeth, out of your mouth and, and the, the feeling of, of air filling your lungs and, you know, or even feeling a scratch or an itch or something on your, on your neck and wanting to deal with it, but just sitting there and letting those things happen. So it's a continuation of that with walking. Same thing. You're, you're noticing all the different things that may happen. It may be, um, you know, a fire truck going by, right? You don't, a lot of us will just, we'll hear that and then we'll go, oh, I wonder where the fire truck's going. I wonder where it came from. I wonder if they're okay, but it's just, just let it be. Oh, I heard the noise. In Buddhism, they talk a lot about when you're meditating with walking or, or however, um, to visualize it as uh, your thoughts as bubbles, right? So a thought pops up and then just simply gently touching the bubble so it pops, right? So every time a thought or, or a sensation occurs, noticing it, honoring it, being compassionate of it, and then just allowing it to go and not, and not really focusing too much on one thing or the other. Super interesting. So the, you're, you're visualizing your ideas as thoughts as you're walking around and then you're focusing on just the, you're almost like bringing your intention, your attention internally and you're focusing on what am I feeling? What is the, can I feel the wind, you know, on my cheek? Can I, you know, I feel my breath go in, my breath go out. Can I feel my back on my back bouncing around or whatever it is? Yeah, absolutely. And then how, how long do you, would you spend, uh, you said 10, 15 yeah, 10, 15 minutes is typically, you know, but I mean, it could be, you could do it for an hour. I mean, you could do it for 30 minutes. There's no real set. That's one thing I think we get caught up in, in, in as Westerners is we, you know, give me all the boxes that I need to check, <laughs> right? Like, give me the steps that I need to follow so that I can be, as you said, better. Um, and so we kind of get lost in, 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 and am I doing it right? Am I not doing it right? Um, that's why it's always easy. Like I said, always just go back to the breath. When in doubt, go back to the breath. That's always a great little anchor of, of mindfulness in, in any activity. I do it before I do give presentations. Um, I just sit there and, and focus on my breath, you know, and before a room full of 20, 30 people come in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that it benefits myself and hopefully the people that I'm talking to as well. <laughs> cool. And so I want to ask one, one more style. So we talked a little bit about the, some, some more advanced tactics. So, so talk yeah. to me about these, uh, was it Tibetan styles you were talking, you were mentioning? Yeah. So, um, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, there is a style of meditation that I've used a ton. Um, that's called Tonglen, T-O-N-G-L-E-N meditation, which is just, it, it, it means sending and taking. Um, so it's a, it's a way to cultivate compassion for yourself as well as, as for others. Maybe compassion for difficult people. I've used this a lot in sales, in business, when I know that I'm going to have a tough conversation or maybe when 
I have a tough call with somebody or a tough meeting with somebody and they're, you, you know, who the people out there and you, they're, they're, they're just jerks, right? They're mean to you. They don't care. They don't care about your feelings. They don't care about your product. They don't care about anything. They're having a tough day and they want to take it out on you, right? We've all experienced that. And so I found Tonglin meditation really useful in those periods. And what it is, is it's simply sitting down. And like I said, starting with the, the breath, the in and out, setting the table. And then you visualize breathing in. And in Tibetan Buddhism, they do a lot of visual, visualization. So they'll, a lot of times they'll say to visualize like black smoke or something of that nature. So you're, you're, you're breathing in the other person's suffering, right? Because at the end, of the end of the day, we're all suffering. And sometimes we project that suffering uh, as being jerks to people. And, and so it's a way of visual. Let's say I got off the phone with somebody. They said, screw you. I don't ever want to talk to you again. Click. So you can maybe later that day, sit down, visualize that person in front of you and visualize when you breathe in on the one that you're breathing in all of their suffering. And it's like this black smoke. And when you exhale and breathe out, you're, you're, you're breathing out compassion and empathy and love and joy to that person, right? And just visualize that over and over and over and over again. And it'll start to cultivate this compassion in yourself and for others. Sometimes people find it easier to start doing it with somebody that they like, <laughs> you know, like a loved one or your friend, and you kind of visualize breathing in all of their suffering and, and breathing out kind of this healing compassion and empathy. And then you move to somebody maybe that's neutral, that you really don't care either way. And then moving into somebody that's, that's what can, would be considered a difficult person. Cool. And you know, you, you I, I got to ask, so it, this, uh, this doesn't sound like something that would take a minute uh, or two to do. Yeah. Tonglen meditation. I mean, it's, 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 you know, probably closer to like 30 minutes. It's, it's more of an advanced um, form of meditation. It, it's not something I would, it's not something I would suggest someone that hasn't meditated do before only because I think that'll turn off a lot of people because you, you want to make sure that, like I said, you've set the table correctly and, and setting the table correctly to even get into the visualization meditation is being aware and mindful and present of, of, of yourself and your thoughts and things of that nature. So if you sit down and just start thinking about somebody and, and it, it might, you know, it might make you more upset if, if you don't kind of have that, that base of, of breathing mindfulness. Gotcha. So the, the intro is essentially starting for a minute, working up to 10 minutes of just count breathing, count in on the one or breathe in on the one, breathe out on the two, in yeah. on the one, out on the two, sort of. Once you've, once you've been doing that for, you've, you've cultivated that sort of behavior, that habit for a couple of weeks, then maybe step up to the walking around. Yeah. That's and then you're plan. walking around and you're sort of, uh, you're visualizing the, uh, or just experiencing all this, the, the different sensations. And that's, that probably takes some time to build up to the, the Tonglin meditation, which is probably at like, when we're talking months, years. Yeah, you know, it's it's per person. For me personally, I didn't. You know, I had probably been meditating about ten years before I um, before I got into Tonglen meditation, and it, I, maybe it's it's partly because um, I don't know if I was ready for it, and two, it this you know a time in my life presented itself. So for me, when I actually really started um, using Tonglen meditation, I was going through a divorce. And it was about um, five or six years ago. And I found this book by Pima Chodron, um, which was called When Things Fall Apart. And um, not, not the classic When Things Fall Apart. It was, it was her version. And it was really just um, her perspective on, on how to use Buddhism, how to use meditation in really difficult times. And Tonglin was something that she talked about. And um, it changed my life, man. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not just kind of saying that. Like, it really meditation as a whole just completely changed my perspective of myself and, and, and externally of, of the world and of people. So, um, yeah, but tongue meditation, is not something I don't think you, you, you definitely need to work up to it. a couple of months, you know, year, year or two. 
It, or, you know, try, try, try sitting down on a cushion for 30 minutes and just counting your breath. And if you can make it through that a couple of times, um, then hell, go for it. <laughs> perfect. So I know, I know you haven't, you haven't been in sales without having gone through or, or you were, you were sort of mindful before you were in sales. What do you, what do you think that, um, that mindfulness has helped you sort of achieve as a, as a sales rep? What would have been some of the sort of benefits that you can see or, or some of the, some of the, like, what are some of the benefits? What are some of the times where you've implemented it or you've used some of the things that you've learned in order to help you get a better outcome that you might not have had you not known anything? Yeah. About mindfulness. I think the, just the whole perspective of compassion and empathy. Like, you know, we talked before the call a little bit, empathy and compassion and collaboration and things of this nature are, are like hot buzzwords and hashtags right now and, and sales and on LinkedIn and things of that nature, which I think is great. Um, but, you know, a lot of times I'm not sure sales reps really co-sign to those things, right? I, th- I think a lot of us talk about being compassionate and empathetic of, uh, a client or prospects needs, but, but are we really? And, mm-hmm. and so for me, I think, um, mindfulness and meditation is, has helped me truly cultivate compassion for people just genuinely. And so I think that that makes me a better type of sales professional that I want to be, which is someone that is compassionate and empathetic to, um, to, a, to a client's needs. And, and, and sometimes that means knowing when to walk away. Sometimes that means knowing when to say, you know what, I don't think we're the right fit for you. Um, and that happens on a daily basis for me, you know, and, and, and it's not, uh, it's not like a, it's not a tactic. It's not like a trick. It's not like a, Oh, when they say this objection, I'm going to say, I might not be the right fit for you and see what they say. Right. Like, because that, that forces them to go, well, wait a second, you are, who are you to tell me? You know, it's, it's not really, it's not a tactic or anything like that. It's just a general, um, genuine feeling of compassion and, and, and wanting of partnership. So I think that that mindfulness is definitely, I don't think that I could have a successful career in sales as far as I have without having a basis of, of, of mindfulness and meditation, to be honest with you. I think I would just be, a, you know, I was kind of a jerk when I was younger. Seriously, I was just, I was kind of a jerk and I was kind of selfish, which a lot of us are as, you know, especially when we're young, when we're younger. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's okay. It's just kind of part of growing up. Um, although some of us don't ever, but uh, I think for me, mindfulness and meditation really um, allowed me to, um, to cultivate that awareness and, and that compassion for people, which is, has done wonders for my sales career. Phenomenal. Um, Keith, that really appreciate you taking some time to teach us about meditation. I want to do two, two last things. I want to take it. Let's, let's sort of zoom out. Let's get a little bit, uh, back into the sales world. Uh, we'll get some tactical, get tactical with the lightning round. So we've got three questions I prepped you on and I, I added one more, um, that I think you'll, um, cause you sell to, I know it sounds like you also sell to other salespeople that sell to dentists. Is right. it primarily to other salespeople or is it to, do you sell directly to dentists? It's pretty much split in half. So okay. a lot of what I do is selling to coaching sales reps on how to sell our products. And then also what I do is, is sell directly to end users. So I'm Perfect. kind of got a unique role where I'm doing a little bit of both. Okay. And so you also do plenty of time crushing the phone. So what do you do when people are brushing you off? You're, you're dialing, 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 you're getting the no thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the most important way to get past the no thanks is to make sure that your opening line is something that doesn't lead to a no thanks. So one thing that I have been doing recently that works for me in my particular industry, which is infection prevention products, is when I'm calling an office, I'll ask, you know, hey, Mary, I've got a really quick question for you. If you had to give you and your office a letter grade today on your infection prevention process, what would it be? Right. And that usually opens up a conversation because, you know, whatever it is, ABC, whatever it is, it Mm -hmm. leads to a conversation. Mostly people never give A. (laughs) They are, they know they're like, oh, C or B, we could do better. And and then that kind of opens up the conversation on, on what I do and if what I do makes sense to fit with what they do. I did have somebody say that, 
give themselves an A once. And I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> wasn't expecting this. And, they, and I said, oh, man, that's awesome. Like, you know, give me a high five over the phone. I said, well, let, before I let you go, can I ask you what your process looks like? Because I have tons of clients that give themselves C's and D's. And I would love to give them some tips on how that they, they can better their infection prevention process. And then from that, we kind of discovered they were more maybe of a B or not. So I think the most important thing is, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think I think the most part is be enthusiastic, right? I, there's uh, Jed Blunt has talked a lot about almost kind of ignoring it, <laughs> like apologizing and then kind of ignoring, saying, "Oh no, thanks." Like, "Oh, I know, I'm sorry, this isn't a bad time. How about I call you tomorrow?" At, you know, like kind of yeah. just brushing it off, um, because a lot of times I think it's just this automatic thing. Ah. Uh, if someone says no thanks to me before I've even really presented my value, then for me, that means I did something wrong in how I'm presenting myself. The first sentence out of my mouth just screamed salesperson. Mm -hmm. And so I failed, right? So it's back to the drawing board on the next call. How can I make it better so that no thanks isn't even part of the vernacular of the conversation? So you open, hey, this is Keith Cordero. I'm looking for so and so. Yeah, I'll say, um, well, honestly, I'll do a little bit of research beforehand to get to see if I can get the name of the office manager, which is usually the ones that make decisions. Um, and I'll just call, hey, Mary, is Sarah there? And you know, well, who's calling? This is Keith Cordero with Crosstex. Oh, okay. Usually they just pass it right along. Um, and then once she gets in, say, I don't even get into the introduction of who I am usually. It's, hey, you know, this is Keith Cordero with Crosstex. I've got a really quick question for you. And then I go into that. So it's kind of disruptive in a sense. It's like, wait a second, you know, who the hell are you asking me a question? But it's such a simple question and everyone wants to answer it. No one's, no one has, I've, I've not one time ran into somebody yet who didn't answer the question. They just said, I don't have time for this. They'll at least say, Ooh, you know, they'll, they'll say a letter grade because they want to grade themselves. <laughs> they want a cookie, you know? So yeah. And it's an easy question to answer. It's ABC. I know all three answers. Yeah, we all know some, we all know a grade, you know, and we all kind of, ha we have an idea. If I'm an office manager, I have a pretty good idea of what the grade of my infection prevention process is in the office, right? So. Very interesting. Kind of a no-brainer. Okay. And so what about, uh, how do you get people to respond, to respond to your emails? Man, I think in this day and age, it's important to utilize every single piece of communication software and avenues that are possible. If you're just picking up a phone and you're just leaving messages, you're not doing enough. If you're just cranking out emails, you're not doing enough. If you're just posting on LinkedIn, you're not doing enough. You really have to, because we, as buyers, we all um, are stimulated by different things in different ways. And different products and services stimulate us in, on different platforms. Um, and so if if you're just calling everybody, then you may be calling 20 people that respond, would respond to you like that if you just texted them or mm -hmm. vice versa. If you're just, so for me, I, 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 number one, I try to attack all avenues. And then once I kind of start building a relationship, I make notes to myself either in a CRM or something or on my phone or something of that nature that says this person responds better to text. Right, so I know when I'm reaching out to the, that person, step one, I need to text them. Hmm. Um, the other big thing that I try to do with every kind of interaction is I try to leave some sort of value with every interaction. I hate the just checking up. I hate the I was just in the neighborhood kind of stuff. I don't want to be that. I've been that. I probably will be that at some point again. <laughs> um, so it's, I, I know that it's easy to fall into that. But I just try with every single interaction is, is this convert, am I adding value to this conversation? Is this pushing the sales process forward, not only for me, but for them? Or am I just kind of, you know, trying to dig up old stuff that's been buried? Um, so those are my two big things, you know, utilize every single piece of communication uh, avenue that there is and make sure that you're providing value each interaction. Cool. And I and I'm going to swap in my last question with what's the best way to book a meeting with a dentist? Are you cold calling? Are you emailing them? Do you, do you just walk in and, or an office manager at a dental office? 
Yeah. You know what? Honestly, I mean, it's picking up right now. So I've LinkedIn is kind of picking up a little bit more social. I think they're behind everybody else. They're not, you know, in the software tech industry. So um, the B2B, although it kind of is B2B, but they're not really in that world quite yet. But mm-hmm. there are some younger doctors that are getting out of school that are on LinkedIn a ton. They're on Instagram a lot. So I've I've connected a lot with with doctors on Instagram and LinkedIn, of mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, posting blogs and things of that nature and adding value that way. And then saying, oh, he liked that and kind of reaching out on a DM. Hey, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but mostly, honestly, right now, it's just phone calls and, and cold calling and knocking on doors. That's the best way to book meetings in, in my industry right now, just the old school way of doing it. That's fair. My, my dentist is on Strava, so I can see him there and like chat to him that way. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So, cool. <laughs> yeah I'm, not, I'm not an Instagrammer, but yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely follow you on Strava. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So Keith, really appreciate you coming on. I want to give you a chance to, to promote one thing. And we had kind of talked about your podcast. So we're going to do a little cold call role play. Let's, let's put these, uh, put your chops into action. So who am I a potential listener of the show? Excellent. Well, so the philosophy of sales podcast started as a blog about a year ago. Go, okay, so we're, we're actually gonna i'm gonna ring ring and you're gonna give me a oh call. you're oh we're really doing role playing we're actually doing a cold call role play okay cool I, you don't actually have to call me i'll just pick up my phone we'll pretend okay so i, I you want me to say ring ring yeah I'll, I'll i usually say ring ring that's my that's my uh, line is that your thing? Okay, <laughs> i don't want to take it from you man dare you how dare you <laughs> <laughs> and then you gotta call and convince me to give you some time and then uh subscribe to your podcast and give you five stars on itunes because that's what we all want Okay. All right. Ready. Ring, ring. Hi, this is Colin. Hey, Colin. This is Keith Cordero with the Philosophy of Sales. How are you? Good. Good. I'm just good. about to walk into a meeting. What do you want? How are you? Okay. Let me just give you one minute, or you give me one minute. How's that? Sounds good. So I talked to James Bowden, and he says that you are a host of a podcast, so I can assume that you also enjoy listening to podcasts. True. Yeah. Well, I am the host of a podcast. It's called The Philosophy of Sales. And what we do is we focus on using discovery, collaboration, and compassion in all sales transactions, regardless of size or scope. Is that something that you would be interested in listening to if I sent one over to you? It sounds interesting, but I don't think I quite understand what you're like, why I'm going to, like, why I would listen. Why would you would listen? Well, what are some of your favorite podcasts? I like the, the Mixergy podcast. I like the uh, the Joe Rogan podcast lately, and Sam uh, waking up with Sam or not wake, Sam Harris waking up. Excellent. And about Joe Rogan, he man, he's all over the place. He talks about you know, philosophy. He talks about he's crazy, and I I still kind of don't like him, but he's got the best like, guests. And yeah, kind of watching car job. wreck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, he's a car wreck of a podcast. Well, ours isn't quite that bad of a wreck, but what we do is we do have conversations about philosophy, business, and everything in between. We kind of we kind of connect the business side world with more of a philosophical thinking man, thinking woman's kind of ideas that can be implemented into sales and how it can make you as a sales professional even better. Is that something you would be interested in hearing more about? Sounds super interesting. Where can I find you? All right. I'll send it over. <laughs> so you're on, people can check you out on iTunes, YouTube, all, the, all those channels? Yeah, we're on iTunes, Spotify, all that good stuff. Yeah, Philosophy of Sales. And you can also go to the website, which is the, the philosophyofsales.com, which is the blog, and it has um, links for the podcast as well. Right on, Keith. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Um, go to the philosophy of sales.com and there's a spot where you can shoot me uh, an email or you can find me on LinkedIn, Keith Cordero. Perfect. Keith, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm, I'm going to go take a few minutes and uh, do some meditating before I move on to my next, uh, my next meeting. Excellent. Sounds perfect. Thanks, Colin. Right on. Thanks, Keith. Remember everybody breathe. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.